Thank you. No pressure at all. Um, this might be the most beautiful room. I'm probably not the most beautiful presenter. Um, nor is this probably the catchiest title. You're not going to win an award on a title like a classification matrix of examination items to promote transformative assessment. But at the same time, it is, I think, a very important topic because, after all, it's about outcomes. It's actually about trying to make sure that when we uh, create assessment items for students, when we create curricula for students, that we know that those uh, materials that we're working with actually meet the outcomes that we expect and need from our students. What I'm talking about today is part of an industry project which our university is doing with a, um, an educational technology company in Perth called Single View International. They have a learning management system that they're developing called Virtuoso, which is a full 360 student-centered learning environment um, used primarily um, at this stage in the secondary education environment, but also uh, rolling out a little bit more to tertiary environments. And this is really the first stage of the project. What we wanted to do was to create some way where we could assist teachers and assist learners in understanding the outcomes that were expected of them as they learn. Now this is a very important thing in the tertiary context because um, at the moment we're in a, an extremely, uh, I like the word dynamic uh, state of affairs in Australia where we have a, a weird mixture of a highly regulated environment with also a focus on deregulation. So what that means is that we have governing bodies that are telling us at the moment, this is what you should do, uh, but we're not going to tell you how to do it, but if you don't achieve those outcomes, we can essentially cancel your license as a university. We've also moved towards a national um, curriculum in the secondary school system, and there were some conversations yesterday in one of the presentations about the ideological bases of curriculum. But what it essentially means now is that we are very outcomes-driven, um, and these outcomes are, have to be extremely explicit, and they also have to be... Um, tied to evidence of student achievement in their work. So that means if we get audited as a university, we have to show that students have met those outcomes at a level and quality that is expected from really a whole range of um, organisational, I guess, imperatives. So we have things like TEXA, which is the governing body of Australian higher education. We have the Higher Education Standards Framework, which set thresholds, which is really a sort of self-regulating thing. And then we have a thing called the Australian Qualifications Framework, which defines what is a bachelor's degree in Australia, what is a master's degree, what is the volume of learning, what are the outcomes expected. And most Australian universities have gone through massive curriculum renewal projects, really defining the these outcomes and also identifying where the evidence is. So in order to do that, you need to understand outcomes. You need to really understand explicitly what are the cognitive levels that students are achieving. And we're going to be focusing on cognitive outcomes particularly because that's, I think, most relevant to higher education and probably the most uh, important to, uh, and easiest to assess. So taxonomies, there are a million of them, and I'm going to go through them very quickly. I'm going to try and uh, have a record today for the most slides in any presentation given in 20 minutes. Um, so they'll be quick. I will promise I won't linger on them. There are probably also the other record would be the most tables in any paper, if you actually check the paper out, um, possible, because what we're doing is synthesizing a whole bunch of these taxonomies. Now, these taxonomies are hierarchical. They tend to subsume lower order levels with higher order levels. Some Examples I'm going to explain today are things like um, those offered by Bloom, Gagné, Merrill, the solo taxonomy, which is very common in secondary education. And really the purpose of this stage of the research project was to come up with an integrative taxonomy of learning outcomes that synthesizes all of the best of these. So this is one that we all know, yeah? Everyone's familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, 1953, been around since, you know, since before I was born. And of course, it shows that hierarchical knowledge scaffold from knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis to evaluation, with the idea that higher order outcomes require a greater level of abstract abstraction and a deeper level of thinking. So um, while knowledge might involve facts, Evaluation really involves you. Well, you need knowledge, you need understanding, but you also be able, need to be able to bring it all together to be able to judge the value of something. 
Okay, Gagné's taxonomy is a little bit different. Rather than focusing, I think, primarily on the uh, conceptual outcomes and the levels of processing, inherent information processing required by students, it's much more content-driven. Um, and I think that comes from the fact that um, Gagné was an arch instruction, instructionalist working primarily in the military as well as higher education. And so he talked very much about the types of information. Again, hierarchical from the most basic forms, verbal, concrete, con verbal information, concrete concepts, defined concepts, rules, higher order rules, down to the highest level being strategies. All right, so we have really two dimensions already that we're talking about. And yet, wait, here's a third. Okay, you're starting to see a pattern here. All of these people sort of reinventing the wheel, but using a different language and defining it in terms that really address different types of context. So um, David Merrill um, is still around. Um, he's still sort of um, active researching and presenting as far as I know. And what he's done is he's actually said, well, let's take this notion of the information processing levels, let's take the content classifications and create two dimensions. So within that, you've got things like remember an instance, remember generality, use and find. I mean, an obvious thing would be remember an instance, Ah, you know, I touched a hot plate, it burned me, you know? Remember generalities. Ah, oh, that plate looks hot, maybe I won't touch it. Um, use is don't touch that hot plate. Find is, well, maybe I use oven mitts, you know, that kind of thing. So it's sort of uh, that notion that what you're doing is you're abstracting uh, in terms of performance, but also in terms of content, from facts right through to principles. So there are four levels here. Um, this one is extremely common in secondary education. And this doesn't actually split them up into those two levels of um, cognitive processing and types of knowledge. Rather, what it does is try and integrate them again into a kind of content matrix which talks about very much, oh, bad typo, but talks very much about the kinds of artifacts, if you like, that are produced in learning. So in the solo um, taxonomy, you would be able to assess a student's work by identifying the extent to which it demonstrated either pre-structural understanding, the information might be a little bit irrelevant, unistructural, one concept easily explained, multi-structural, integrating different concepts, relational understanding how these concepts relate, to extended abstract, to be able to go beyond the information to new information. And this is a very common thing, I think, that when we create rubric in higher education, we pretty much focus on this type of thing, don't we? We often really look at where's the complexity of thought in this assignment and things like that. Now, as if that wasn't enough, people have sort of said, well, okay, now that we've got all these different taxonomies, let's go back at Bloom and let's recreate it again. So you're familiar with Bloom's um, um, revised taxonomy. Strangely enough, it's probably not as common as the previous one. The main thing there is that they've changed the language. Take the nouns out, put verbs. It's about what students do. It's about them remembering instead of knowing, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. It's much more actively driven. You'll notice that we've got creativity now at the top of the tree, which is an interesting thing, creativity, evaluation. Either way, you could certainly call them both higher order. But also what they've done in Bloom is that they've taken this hierarchical um, cognitive processing dimension, but they've then added another epistemo epistemological dimension to that. And if you actually look, it's not so dissimilar, is it, from Merrill's um, taxonomy with factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, procedural knowledge. But now what he's talking about is rather than principles, metacognitive knowledge, which I don't think is necessarily the same thing. You can know principles as received principles, but metacognitive knowledge is kind of inherently developed from yourself. So while there are lots of similarities to these things, there are lots of differences too. But one thing that is key is that we're really talking about at least two dimensions, the content to be learned and the level at which the, um, the learner is processing that information, scaffolded from lower order to much more higher order types of outcomes. So what we did was we said, let's bring it all together. And we ended up with um, essentially sort of five classification components of knowledge, from facts, concepts, procedurals, 
taking the principles of Merrill, taking the metacognitive um, knowledge of the, uh, of the revised Bloom's taxonomy, and treating that as this is a level of information processing, a level of conceptual understanding that students would need to demonstrate. And then what we also looked at is what is the epistemological basis of this? They might understand something, but are they understanding a um, simply a, uh, a, hang on, here we go, um, are they understanding uh, basic content or are they understanding um, conceptual high level um, and metacognitive types of um, knowledge? So we pulled it together into this thing that we call the instructional activity matrix. And the reason we called it that is because effectively, as a teacher, you're often responsible for two things, setting outcomes and setting assessments. And those two things really are very much what students focus on too. Actually, they don't focus on the outcomes, they focus on the assessments. But while they might be thinking, what do I actually have to do? As a teacher, you're thinking, what do they need to achieve? And then how do they need to demonstrate that? And then how are you going to create assessment items that will allow them to demonstrate that? And I think this is probably where there's a bit of a gap at the moment. And this is what we found. There's a gap between this understanding of outcomes and what you want the students to do, right down to this point at, well, how are they demonstrating those outcomes? How do you know that they're happening? So what we did was we took this, these two dimensions came up with five levels of knowledge, facts, concepts, procedures, principles, and metacognition, and um, five cognitive processes from remember right through to create. So kind of similar to all of those, some common elements, but also synthesizing those types of things. Now what we've done is we've taken that and we've said, great, now what we want to do is to create some kind of autonomous system that can effectively take an assessment item or a unit outline and be able to give feedback on the extent to which it meets those types of outcomes. And that's challenging. Um, initially, when I spoke to Single View, they were all about, oh, we'll have this thing that will tell you whether your assignment is good. And I'm a bit concerned about that. Rather, how about we use it as a feedback tool so that teachers can understand the nature of the assessments they're producing and whether they're targeting um, their appropriate things. So essentially what it is, it's a kind of um, an algorithm that focuses on the language of um, instruction, discuss, dramatize, explain, tied to specific levels, um, both in terms of um, key educational verbs and also the prepositions. How, when, why, what. What generally is lower order than why, for example. And the idea is that by excluding common or ambiguous words and refining the process, you end up with a tool that can take uh, a huge assignment and give you feedback on where it fits in this matrix. So, Sample instruction, what are the characteristics of a eucalyptus tree? We're really expecting people to recall familiar concepts from memory according to their defining characteristics. Well, that fits in a remember dimension, and we're talking about remembering concepts. So it's about recognizing concepts in that case. Here's a typical learning outcome. Students will examine cutaway diagrams which detail the features of a submarine. Actually, it's an activity, really, isn't it? Well, what we're asking them to do here is summarize a set of features or components of some kind of entity. So it's working at that understanding level, but we're dealing with facts. We're not dealing with um, ideas at a broader level. A more complex type of knowledge would be describe how you successfully learn to ride a bike. Now, how many people can really do that? It requires a certain type of metacognitive um, skill. Summarize a set of features or components of some kind of entity. So that is very much comprehending your own learning process if you can explain it. And finally, relate the law of gravity to the construction of simple machines. We're talking about relating principles. It's about principles and application. Again, we're dealing with something that's sort of in the middle order of um, cognitive processes, but dealing with principles. Okay, I'll just flick through that just to sort of say that the idea behind all of this, and this is some actual example, real output from the system at the moment, is that if you take a unit outline um, or a course outline, or you take a large piece of assessment and you run it through the system, you'll be able to see through um, a heat map pretty much where that assessment is pitched. 
Okay? Is it pitched at understanding? Is it pitched at analyzing? So this would be a reasonably lower order assessment, wouldn't it? We're dealing with facts and understanding, we're dealing with um, conceptual knowledge, and we're dealing with principles, but really at the remember, understand, and apply level. Okay? That then will allow a teacher to know, actually, given our national curriculum, given the learning outcomes that are set for us by the government, are we at, um, achieving that? So with these aggregated um, results, what you're able to get is feedback that you can use to guide the uh, design um, of courses and assessment. It's meant to enhance teachers' capacity to write effective assessment out outlines. And that's really what we're after here. Okay? I'm really worried about any foolproof tool that says it will test an assessment and say whether it's good. That's not really what this is about. Okay? Because I don't think that you can actually measure the quality of assessment on the basis of a piece of software that picks up key terms and matches them according to a matrix. But what it is extremely powerful for is as a tool, as a prompt, as a reflection tool, as something that teachers can then use to actually say, all right, here's some feedback on my assessment. This is where I think it sits. These are the holes, these are the things that I need to probably refine in my assessment or within my unit to make sure it's achieving the outcomes, for example, of a bachelor's degree or master's degree or a year 11 assignment or something like that. And it allows us then to engage in a dialogue and discussion about how you would do that. So it's primarily a self-assessment tool. And of course, the other thing about it too is that students will be able to get feedback on which types of responses they're struggling with. Because I've got a problem with my daughter who does English um, in high school, and actually her functional English is really brilliant, but she failed English last year, and I'm an ex-literature teacher, and it really, I really struggled with that. And I thought, I read her assignment, I thought, actually, this is quite well written. But you know what she wasn't doing? She wasn't interrogating the um, notion of the Victorian gentleman in George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. She was saying, Eliza Doolittle was a working class person who did the, she was operating at that lower order um, of thinking and if she saw where she was actually responding and, the, and how well she was doing, she would be able to say, ah, okay, this is a critical level that I'm struggling with, it's a contextual level that I'm struggling with, not an understanding of the basics of the text. I understand the themes, I just don't understand it at that highly critical um, level. So the idea of this is that what we want to do is give students a rich feedback-based environment so that they can understand their own learning because ultimately I think what we want is we want the kind of the, the uber student, don't we? You know, this highly metacognitive student that is aware of their own learning processes and you know what? It doesn't happen, I don't think, very often in formal situations. We're very good at scaffolding knowledge. We're not very good at scaffolding metacognition. So any tools that we have that can give us that type of feedback, I think, are particularly powerful. So the second stage of this that we're about to begin this year is really piloting the tool and the instructional activity matrix with real assessments uh, from the secondary school sector. In uh, the diocese, the Catholic Diocese of Sydney, Parramatta, where um, the learning management system is widely used. And we're going to be running induction workshops for teachers to refine the lexicon ensure appropriateness across a range of disciplines and assess its value as a valid and reliable tool to give that kind of feedback. Bearing in mind it's not a magic bullet, but what it will hopefully is allow us to understand what we're doing as teachers and to allow students to understand where the gaps in their knowledge are a little bit better. Okay, finished.